The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Okay, hello everyone and welcome to the iSpring Solutions webinar. Thank you very much for joining us today as we will be giving you an intro to successful user experience design. My name is Paulina, I'm a community manager at iSpring and I will be the moderator for today's webinar. And as a speaker, I have invited Scott McCormick. Hi Scott, how are you doing today? Hello everybody, I'm doing great. Wonderful. Scott has over three decades of experience in providing outstanding UX and, to, and he has designed this unique approach of which he will be talking about today for you guys. So, as always, you're more than welcome to ask your questions and you can do so by submitting them in the question box and you will find it on the right side of the GoToWebinar panel. It should be somewhere on the bottom. And on the screen right now, you can see what it looks like. Okay, so... I uh, just wanted to remind you that we will have about 10, 7 to 10 minutes at the end of the webinar for your questions. So we will have a Q&A, but just in case you have any questions during the presentations, don't wait, don't hesitate to submit them and we will see if we can take care of them right away. All right, so I think that at this point we are ready to begin. So Scott, let me please pass the mic over to you. Okay. Okay, I'm going to show my screen and then I'm going to get my presentation moving here. All right. Very good. How does that look? Perfect. Looks wonderful. Excellent. Excellent. Well, hello. And usually I say something like uh, good morning or good afternoon, um, but uh, depending on where you're at, uh, good. Let me just say good day. How does that sound? I'm uh, very glad to be here today. I especially want to thank um, iSpring for inviting me to be here today. Uh, it's really quite a privilege to spend some time um, with you folks. And then I'd like to thank you as well for attending, or maybe you're uh, listening to the recorded version at a later time. Uh, thanks so much for just giving me a little bit of your time um, this winter, if in fact it is winter where you are. You gotta keep remembering my international audience this time. So as Polina said, my name is Scott McCormick. My company is called Emergent Enterprise. And uh, that company just started in the fourth quarter of last year. I have been in the corporate communications business for over 30 years, but uh, last year I decided it was time for me to start help start my third company, um, I had done two others, uh, but this time I was ready to go out on my own. And so that's what I did. And I'm very excited about Emergent Enterprise and, and uh, to be able to do things that I'm very passionate about. And one of those things is user experience. And that's what we'll be talking about today. So let me just give you a little background about Emergent Enterprise. It's essentially twofold. One of those parts is consulting. and I do work with companies um, to help them figure out strategy and implementation of all of these new types of technologies that are in uh, and available to the business world. And I'm, I'm talking not just about uh, mobile devices that we use all the time, um, but even these new newer types of things like wearables, watches around our wrists, or maybe even augmented reality or virtual reality. So helping companies do that. And I also go out and speak, and I was just talking with Polina. Um, and it really varies my speaking engagement. So last week on Tuesday, I was speaking to a, um, a very large US um, national uh, um, association that has over 400,000 members. But I was just on site there in their in their offices in Chicago speaking about UX um, with a small group of about a dozen in their training department. But two days later, I was on a panel at a conference um, about new technology speaking to 400 people. 
So the speaking part of things can really vary. And if you'd be interesting, interested in having me come and speak to your company, um, just reach me through uh, my contact information there. But another part that I'm really uh, excited about with Emergent Enterprise is the Emergent Enterprise website. That's where I post articles about uh, the very things that uh, we're talking about today. And that's, it, it might be about user experience, it might be about um, just case studies of businesses and how they're using um, uh, uh, these types of technologies uh, in their businesses and, and using them successfully. So thanks again for having here, but let's dive into the presentation now. So user experience, we may think that's uh, you know, just uh, one other element of any kind of initiative that we might be taking on. Maybe it's a, a mobile training of some sort, or maybe you are, are already moving into augmented reality or virtual reality. But user experiences can be uh, a top priority and it can be very important. It happened just recently uh, here in the United States, and I'm sure you saw this in the in the news, um, where in the state of Hawaii, uh, hundreds of thousands of people received a, a, a notification on their mobile devices that a ballistic missile had been launched and was headed towards Hawaii. Of course, this caused great um, alarm and confusion and it turns out uh, it was a false alarm. It never should have happened. And what you're looking at on your screen is what the Hawaii Emergency Management Agency released and said, this is the user interface that that person was using um, at the time of the false alarm. And let me show you the difference between just doing the drill in doing the actual um, alarm. The first, the arrow is pointing to what the, what the uh, operator should have clicked on their user interface. And then what he, what he or she really clicked was this. That was the only difference between a, the drill um, or sending the entire island, in fact, the entire nation, in fact, the entire world into confusion and disarray. Thank goodness nobody got harmed um, or there was no response to this, um, and it, but it did take 38 minutes for them to figure out that um, a false alarm had gone off, all because of a bad user interface, all because of a bad user experience. Now, I think I could throw out uh, to you, to the audience here, and ask you, what are some ways that it could have made this um, this huge mistake not happen? If you'd like, you can just type some of your answers in the questions area. How could how how could this been designed a little differently so that this this huge mistake didn't happen? Any thoughts just off the top of your head? Can you see some of the, uh, okay. some of the resources? So, yeah, Edward said, uh, that's not what I wanted to have happen. Um, a confirmation method, use icons. Timothy, that's a great idea. Better labeling, maybe not just have them be so similar in labeling. That's a good one, Alice. A second step, yeah, that confirmation. Uh, several of you are, are saying that confirmation. Those are all great ideas, but those are all things we need to think of when it comes to user experience. So thanks, thanks for participating in that question. Now, I'm gonna give you a little um, charge uh, uh, exercise to do throughout the presentation today, okay? So in my town here in Illinois, um, we, we, they have been building for um, high-speed rail to go through to go through the town, and that's meant a lot of work on the on the railroad crossings and and things like that. And uh, as part of that new look, they put it, put up these signs that are near the crossings, 
and they say no train horn and then they have that symbol above that you can see there and I thought boy you know I don't think that's the actual primary message of what what they want to tell drivers you know that I feel like this could be a better user experience um, than putting up this sign that says no train horn that doesn't really tell me what I'm supposed to be thinking or doing and so as we go through the ACT connection which is my approach to successful user experience I want you to sort of keep in mind this traffic sign and maybe by the end of the um, presentation we can think of um, a better way to uh, to do this traffic sign and then maybe I'll maybe I'll go to the next town meeting and tell them hey let's change these traffic signs to be better okay so that that's going to be your charge this time sorry I keep up on here I want to get rid of my Google Drive notification so hang on just a minute there we go all right so user experience is everywhere like I said in fact I have to think about UX even for this particular presentation which can be hard because you want to design for the UX for your audience and for something like this audience it can be very uh, it can be quite varied right some of you may have some background in UX and maybe this is too general for you but for some of you who may not have any background this is this is great stuff this happens to me all the time when I speak at conferences and I eventually get the feedback um, from the or the evaluations from the attendees and in one presentation I, I can get super positive this was awesome and others that uh, I'd heard all this before. So it can be impossible, almost impossible to uh, satisfy all your end users, but that should never stop you from trying to get to know your audience as best as you can. What I can try to do is make it unique, really encourage participation, and make, make something memorable. My, my real goal is to have you learn just a nugget or two that you can walk away from this presentation and use it in your everyday job in your everyday life so the ACT connection that for me is audience context and technology if we can make these our understanding of these three things a top priority then um, <clears throat> I think we're really gonna help our chances for um, a better user experience so we're gonna dive into these but here's our goals in each of the in each of these sections with our audience we want our message to resonate we were wanted to really hit home with them and, and be things that they need um, and can use in their everyday job when we think of contents context we're trying to migrate into their world and what I mean by that is we're trying to seamlessly integrate into their world by enter, um, by entering the kind of information that they need and then finally uh, technology and integrate is we want to um, use technology and leverage it the best we can take advantage of its um, it's good points and stay away from the things that might be uh, were actually working against us so that's the ACT and we're going to dive deep into each one of these so what do we mean by user experience well um, there's a great um, Norman Nielsen uh, my goodness I'm having a little glitch in my presentation in that it says user experience in, encompasses all as aspects of the end user's interaction. And the key phrase here is all aspects. It's not just that interaction that's happening when the person, that end user is consuming the information that you're delivering. It's everything about their world. It's everything they think about your company. It might even be the things that you've delivered in the past all of those have an influence 
on the person's user experience. In fact, I call it the big everything. That's the new X of this world. It's changing dramatically. The old model of the way we would train people is to, is and this is somewhat simplistic, but in fact, it's very, it's, it's very true. We would ask them to stop what they're doing and go to a class or maybe sit down at a PC or a laptop and take a course and try to absorb lots of information in an hour, in a half day, in a full day of training. And we would want them to be sponge-like and then take that information and go back to their job and use the information that we've taught them. But now it's different. It's sort of flipped in that now we're saying, hey, we want to be part of your world. We're going to we're going to try to um, work this content, work this information that you need on the job. And we're, tr we're, we're going to try to work it into your workflow so that it smoothly integrates into it. Do you see the difference there? It's quite a flip flop of, of the old model of what we're doing. And so, of course, our user experience is going to be much different. Now, keep in mind, we don't design user experience. We design for the user experience. I want to say that again. We don't design user experience. We design for the user experience. See, we can't totally control everything that's going on around our end users. We can't predict what's going to um, happen in every use case. This morning, for me, is a very good example of that. I was telling Polina before we started. I got to work today, and we have some wonderful offices here. It's on a corner. Uh, we have lots of big windows, so we get lots of natural light. And I got to work today, and there were two huge trucks outside, public works trucks, doing some work under the street. And these trucks are loud and noisy. And so I couldn't be out in our main room um, to give this presentation because of those trucks being really noisy. Although I'm listening now and I don't hear them. But that might be the only time all year that these um, trucks would be out there, of course. So that's a bad coincidence. But I can't, I don't design for that. I design for the, the most ideal user experience. And so I think about what's the best and most ideal conditions and design for that. And then when fringe cases happen, um, then, I, then I work in those as they arise. So we're, we're not the master of the environment of, of our end users, but we can design for them to have a really um, maximum good user experience um, because that's what they're going to be in most of the time. Does that make sense to everybody? Okay, I'm going to keep moving. Feel free to interject at any time if you have a question or a point. Um, um, put it right there in the questions uh, box in the side in the control panel. So let's keep moving. So of course, we know that um, Training is integrating things like smartphones and tablets. I'm sure you're all doing it at this point. At least you should be. And now that it's moving to things like watches and certainly glasses because of augmented reality and virtual reality and other different types of wearables, do you know there's things like smart helmets and smart vests that are being used out on construction and mining sites? When things like um, Bluetooth sensors that you see there. And now we have to think about things like chatbots. You know, we can use chatbots for training, um, but there's a user experience that's involved with chatbots, artificial intelligence, and even the Internet of Things. I was just speaking at a, a conference last week in Chicago, and uh, it was mostly focused on Internet of Things in, in manufacturing. and um, the user experience of uh, Internet of Things implementation um, is 
is just uh, new territory and, and uh, businesses are learning a lot about how the Internet of Things affects workers and their ex work experience dur during the day. So we are blazing some new trails here in UX with these new technologies. It's really quite exciting, I think. So why should you be concerned about UX? And you can fill in your job title right there in the underline. Why should you be concerned with user experience? You know, I, maybe I should throw that out to the audience. You have any quick thoughts of, of why every person should be concerned about user experience? Why is it so important? If you want to drop some of your thoughts in there that uh, you can put them right in the questions area. Any initial feelings or thoughts? Why should everyone on your team be concerned about UX? All right, so Edward says, so they'll adopt those new. Good. Here we go. Keep customers happy, happy campers. Right on, Randy. Results, adoption. You can have the world's best content, but if the UX is not good, no one will get it. Fern, that, that is a great point. Um, and I've seen that happen, and maybe you have too in your businesses that you have super content and then um, it falls flat because of the user experience. And there's just some great stuff coming in. So thank you. Thank you for all those points. Um, we can all affect the user experience, right? So have we ever seen um, a mobile app that runs slowly and that's because of the code behind it? Or maybe it's because of design, um, bad design of the user interface. Maybe it's because um, the, the wrong technology was chosen um, because, of, because of IT made a bad recommendation of what we should use for the devices. Or maybe it's, you know, it can be the instructional designer. Some things don't change and the instructional designer really missed the mark of how this content should flow in and uh, be part of the user experience. So there's a wide range of ways that we can um, affect that user experience and everybody should be making this a priority because um, even their part, even if they feel like it's a small part, they can affect that end user experience. What we're all trying to do are these two things. We're trying to reach our user needs as it says, make life and task easier and simpler. But we're also trying to reach business goals. I'm not naive to not think that a business has goals. And so none of us has an unlimited budget. Um, and if you do, please put your company in the questions area because we all want to work at your company. Um, we have business goals. And so we do have limitations. Um, and we're trying to meet those goals and we're trying to improve in a particular area, um, make productivity better, we're trying to save money, we're trying to gain customers, all these things. And when we can do both with that user experience, that's the sweet spot. This, this uh, little graphic here is from a book called Think First and this is my first resource recommendation of a really easy to read, straightforward approach um, about user experience and other business um, um, approaches by Joe Natoli. So if you can grab that book um, at your bookstore or on Amazon, um, Think First by Joe Natoli, really lays it out really simple and um, straightforward and it, it's a good read. But when all is said and done, when something's gonna work, uh, the key word I use ad nauseum is useful. We need to make things that are useful. And that sounds very logical and very like, um, <clears throat> like, well, yeah, Scott, no, no kidding. But uh, interestingly enough, in, in that 
three decades experience um, that I've had in training, and I bet you guys can tell some of the same stories that that uh, training and development or L&D departments within companies have made a lot of things that aren't very useful. And so they make this, this training module and they upload it to the LMS and they put it out there. And then after a month, nobody's used it. They just miss the mark on the user experience and, and their goals. And so maybe we can just today in our, in our time here, look at a few things that we can hit the mark a little better. So the ACT connection, audience, context, and technology starts with audience. To me, they are the most important stakeholder that you have. I know you have management. I know you have IT as a stakeholder. I know you have even others like maybe legal and marketing and you name it. But when it comes down to it, the audience is your most important st stakeholder. And the way to get to know them to best is through audience empathy. This is a growing field of um, UX in having this audience empathy. And one very interesting way to learn about audience empathy is using a, an audi a empathy map. Have any of you heard of empathy map? An empathy map before? And what you see here, I don't know how well this is showing up on your screen, but you can see a series of questions that you can ask about your audience. And so you get together with your team, and which I recommend, um, um, so, you're, so you have an idea for a new initiative, some type of training, and maybe it's, it's on a mobile, or maybe it's using one of these new technologies. And so you build a team, right? You have a goal, you have a business problem that you want to solve, and you need to get to know that audience. Well, you gather that team, all the, all the stakeholders, and hopefully including even some of the target audience, and you start asking these questions. What do we want them to do? What do they do? What kind of things do they hear and say? And so forth. And just build this empathy map of what their world is like. Now you might be saying, well, how do I, how do I get to um, know this stuff? Oh, by the way, this particular empathy map is from a, um, a site, uh, xplane.com. So the, the letter X, then P-L-A-N-E.com, xplane.com. I tend to like this one, but there's others out there. If you just put empathy map into Google, you'll see others. They're similar in scope. This one is just a little more. Um, comprehensive and, and I like it. Um, so how do, what are ways that we can do it? Well, certainly we can get together as a team and answer these questions as, as well as we can on our own. But the D School at Stanford University recommends these three things. These three things. First of all, observe. So go to where your target audience is and see how they do their job, see how they interact with each other. Um, see how their workday flows. We, then we can engage, obviously. We can talk to them. We can interview them, both in uh, scheduled types of interviews. And then just in matter of fact, maybe it's in the lunchroom. Maybe it's just at a meeting um, that you're both at. Um, maybe it's in the parking lot walking out to the court, cars. Who knows? But engage with them and find out what are their priorities, what are their aspirations, what are their fears even. Learn as much as you can about your, um, <clears throat> your audience. So observe, engage, and then immerse. And what that means is go and experience what your users experience. So if you're building some kind of training for somebody that works on an assembly line, go to that assembly line and if you can actually do the job for a little while um, um, and see what they see and hear what they hear and do what they do, you're going to learn so much. Maybe it's a sales team that's out on the road and you go and you ride with that sales team. And if you can, sit in on a, a customer-facing interaction. 
get to know their world as well as you can. And if you can, this third one, immerse yourself in it, that's a big plus. So let me share a case study that I learned of um, just at the end of last year from one of my contacts at BP. And uh, BP was faced with the charge of training employees for gas stations in Mexico. Um, believe it or not, they had not had any gas stations in Mexico. Obviously, they had been very successful with uh, uh, gas stations throughout, um, throughout the world elsewhere, but not in Mexico. And so <clears throat> they uh, needed to train the workers that would be um, working in these uh, gas stations in Mexico. So what they did is what just what I've been talking about, the audience empathy. They started to learn uh, as much as they could about the target audience. And so what are some things they found out? Well, that these workers were going to be primarily male. They, can, they were going to be working for a minimum age, but they were also risk takers, and they had this type of hero mindset. So just like here in the USA and perhaps maybe even in your country, um, they, they were fascinated by um, superheroes and attracted by superheroes. Um, they, they knew that they were, um, that these uh, target audience members, they, they want to be the leader of their family and they want to be the, the breadwinner of their family as it's, as it's called. And so they built their training around this superhero type of mindset. And they especially focused on Batman because Batman is uh, actually doesn't have any superpowers, say like Superman, for instance, um, but, uh, but he's still a leader and a hero. And so they didn't use the actual Batman because of uh, licensing rights, but they used a very Batman-like superhero, and they integrated that in the training, and they built up um, this training um, around those things that they found out about their target audience, that they wanted to be the hero within their family, and they, they wanted to support their family, and that they could use their brains just like Batman does to solve problems and lead their family. So that's a great point um, of uh, audience empathy, okay? Scott, oh, here's a so Marie question. asked how. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's what I wanted to ask. <laughs> okay. See, when I have to click to see my to see the uh, questions, I have to it it escapes out of my presentation. So okay. sorry for this popping back and forth. So let's. So let's Marie, um, I'm sorry. Go are ahead, you, Polina. Are you going to read the question? I was going to keep an eye out for him, but if you'd like to, if you'd like to do it better that way, I won't have to escape out of my presentation. Sure. So let me read the question from Marie. How did they find out the okay. potential employees of the gas station were risk takers? Right. So they started with their business goal, and that was that was to um, uh, put these new gas stations in Mexico. And then they had to find out, well, who's going to work at these stations? So they sent down a, uh, I guess I'll call it an advanced team, and started to find out um, in the communities where these stations would be, um, who would be responding to the um, um, employment opportunities. And that's when um, the kind of target audience started coming forward, where they found out it would be primarily male. And uh, uh, and then just uh, um, interviewing them to find out what are what are their priorities in life? What are their why are they responding? Why is their interest in this particular job? And that's how they started forming their um, sort of this persona of the target audience. Okay, we're going to keep moving here. So if we go back to, um, guys, if we go back to our traffic sign um, and we think about the audience, um, any thoughts about who our audience is in the, the traffic 
traffic signs. So who's looking at um, who's looking at these traffic signs? The drivers. So the drivers, Dri drivers, yeah. Crossing drivers. the train tracks. Anyone, yep. anyone yep. who has to use this crossing, pedestrians. Could be pedestrians. Very good. Not always drivers. Excellent. Any other thoughts? Pedestrian. Yeah. Okay. Well, and we also know that uh, it's um, Tra train people. operator. Another one. Go ahead. Train, oh, the train, train operator, operator themselves. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, we're just thinking the roles. And we also know that um, it's primarily, let's say, teenagers and up uh, because, yes, a child can read a sign, um, but they're probably not operating a vehicle or maybe are, or even being a pedestrian on their own. So they're relying on the adult that's near them to comprehend it. So um, that's another thing we can determine, that it's probably going to be um, – uh, teenagers and up that really need to understand this, understand it, at least the majority of our tar target audience. Okay, let's keep moving because time is moving fast here. Oh my goodness. Let's talk about context for a little while. And context is the world around us. So I break this down into the hand, the head, and the heart. And what I mean by those things, the hand uh, is in the context, is the conditions, the actual physical environments. And so the sound, it might be the light, space uh, around them, any kind of distractions, even the device itself. And then the head, we're talking about the cognitive load that's taking place in the interaction. You know, uh, people, um, the research tends to show that when you give uh, a cognitive load of more than two or three things that people will start filtering out stuff and prioritize um, all the stuff you're throwing at them. And so we have to think about all the cognitive load in, in the context of a situation. And then finally, the heart, that's the culture of the world around them. It might be economics. It might be religion. It might be etiquette. I mean, think of our um, think of our workers at the BP gas stations. What, what if our what what if we decided, hey, you know what? We have this super cool um, mobile application for smartphones um, that we've been using in the U.S. for workers and our training. We're going to deliver that to our new employees um, in Mexico. That that uh, um, are going to become these new employees at, at the gas stations. Well. Guess what? What if you found out that a majority of your new audience didn't even, didn't, couldn't even afford smartphones? Um, so you've really stumbled there. Um, and so that's how cult, even culture can have an effect on the user experience. So let's do uh, just a little experiment here. Let's say we worked for a construction company and construction companies, when they're building a big building like this, they have to um, use blueprints, right? And blueprints are very unwieldy. You know, they're big printed pieces of paper. Uh, they can be difficult to handle, um, especially if it's windy out or maybe raining. Um, also, they obviously, unless you want to print multiple sets, um, there's only one spot of information, one source of information. So let's say we have this idea, let's move blueprint information to tablets, and then we can deliver that information to tablets to our employees around the work site. Sound like a pretty good idea? Yes, it is. I think, it, I think it's very, and it's being done. It's actually being done by uh, software as a service type companies. But as we're thinking about our target audience, and remember we're talking about the physical environment here, what kind of things in this, in this physical environment that you see in front of you, what kind of things are going to have a bearing on if we make this uh, tablet-based application? What do you think? From the physical environment, what kind of things could have a 
influence or a bearing on our application that's on a tablet. So Wi-Fi or internet connection, then Timothy says safety. Excellent. Mary says, yep. yeah, hard to see table screen and bright sunlight, for example. Right, excellent. Um, how do tablets react to dirt and other realities of a construction site yeah. being dropped, etc.? Battery Good life, point. breakable connectivity. Yeah, guys, these are all size of screen. Yeah, these are all <laughs> tremendous suggestions. Yeah. Even the size of screen. Yeah, that's good, Randy. So you guys have got a lot of these, and I put a few of them on here. So you mentioned a lot of these. Durability, um, noise can be a distraction. Let's say, um, let's say you had some integration of uh, uh, collaboration through voice from different users, but it's hard to hear. The brightness, somebody brought that up. The clothing, let's say our, our users wear sunglasses a lot. We got it. We have to know that if they're going to be looking at our screen because um, that might affect our choice of uh, colors, our user interface, and so forth. There's so also you guys got it down. You, one option from Terry, can use when wearing gloves. So this could also be under clothing, right? Excellent. Yeah, that's uh, that's a point about clothing, too. Uh, if they're wearing gloves and you're you're relying on touch uh, gestures, um, if they have those gloves on, does it even work? Great points, you guys. You get an A plus in that one. And then let's talk about the head and the cognitive load. It's an interesting thing in this uh, type of training that you know we could have all of these different types of cognitive load going on. But let's remember it's happening when it might be happening when they're on the job. They're not sitting in a chair in a classroom. They're not sitting at a chair in a cubicle with a, a laptop. This is happening in, within their job, and we have to keep that in mind all the time and really strive for simplicity and this sort of seamless integration that really only provides the information they need at the time of need. And so that is the um, that is the uh, importance of um, the head, keeping in mind the head. And then finally, the heart. Oh, and by the way, there are some um, great sources of information for uh, interface guidelines, and uh, Apple has them, um, for instance, and uh, and uh, Material IO is the Android user interface guidelines. And follow the heart, and we're talking about culture. And I gave that one example of the um, target audience for the BEP stations, but um, uh, your end users um, may may have some influences on their life that have nothing to do with the content, that have nothing to do with the context of the situation. They might even be in a union, for instance, that. Uh, um, doesn't allow training outside the hours of their actual workday. So if you provide this great training for mobile devices, um, but they can never use it outside of the office, um, that's something you need to know. So you have to keep in mind um, all of all of their um, their world, world around them and what's in, important to them. So that's the heart of context. So let's go back to our traffic sign now. Um, what about the context of the situation? What's the what's the world like around of our end users when they see this sign? So just pop your ideas in there and see what we should know about the context of the situation. What do you think? So Timothy says, Busy driving. Absolutely. We got to keep in mind those drivers, they're not only looking at your sign, they're looking at other signs, they're looking at pedestrians crossing the street, they're looking at other cars passing them or coming the other direction. There's a lot going on in their, 
in their um, in their world. Maybe they got some noisy kids in the car. I know that never happens. Yeah. Um, but there's a lot of <laughs> a lot of things going on. What else, Felina? Yeah, there is a uh, an option like passengers talking or distracted drivers might not even mm -hmm. see it. Industrial area of a city. Expectation yeah. of gates at um, railroad tracks. The sign doesn't tell them what to do, such as watch for train. Okay, Marie, you get a you get a gold star on that one. <laughs> this is the thing that initially bothered me about this sign. There's no um, call to action here, is there? There's no call to action. So we're gonna. We're going to hit this sign one more time before we're done, and I'm going to want you when we when we get come back to the sign. I want you to tell me what should be the call to action. The third part of ACT connection is the technology, and as I mentioned earlier, there are so many new technologies happening now. Boy, if you go to a, a training professional type of conference, um, you just see. Um, all sorts of different things happening, right? And you hear these buzzwords like micro learning and 360 video and all these other types of um, uh, rapid dev solutions, all these kinds of things. It can make your head spin. And uh, it all involves these devices that we talked about earlier. Um, but as you move into these new devices, I believe there's some real priorities that, that you can that you can strive for if possible, if possible. First of all, if it can be hands-free for somebody that's on the job, that's a big plus, um, especially if they need their hands to do whatever job that is that they're doing. Otherwise, you're making them stop and hold up a device. You wanna make it as frictionless as possible. And, and what I mean by that is that you're not disrupting their workflow. And so keep that in mind in your user experience. What I mean by local is that if you can have certain functions of your training happen on the device itself and not be reliant on um, internet access, that's also a big plus. Because as you know, Wi-Fi or other types of internet, internet access can be very um, undependable or can be vary from situation to situation. It can be excellent in some cases, and it can be non-existent in others. So if you if you can have some of the workload be passed to the device, um, that's a big plus. And then what I mean by anticipatory, that's if you can build things into your training that, that um, anticipates what the user is going to do, so in other words, if there's a next step that almost everybody always takes, um, have that step happen automatically instead of letting the user um, take that step. I think we're really moving to uh, no interface type of interactions. We're certainly seeing it with, with voice assistance um coming out yesterday was a big day for apple obviously i don't know if you saw the home pod and all the reviews of that and their and their um device that's going to be very much that is very much like alexa or google home um, these types of voice assistants i see those becoming more prevalent in the workplace and so when we need information we will just speak that and Samba and, and a voice assistant will provide the information. So in other words, maybe we're repairing a um, we're repairing a piece of equipment. We might have a headset on like I do now, and I would just say um, next step, and then in my ear um, would be an explanation of the next step, or I might even be wearing some augmented reality glasses. Um, that show me the next step in my field of vision, and I'm never touching a screen or or, or uh, uh, being relied on to be the interaction with um, gestures. There's a great book about this called The Best Interface is No Interface by Golden Krishna as the author, 
And uh, this is a fun book, believe it or not. He's got kind of a snarky attitude that's fun, but also direct and to the point. And uh, if you can grab that one uh, from Amazon or your local bookstore, um, that's a good one. Okay, so back to our traffic sign one more time. What do you think would be a better, um, uh, as I said, call to action here? What is it that this sign is really trying to tell drivers and pedestrians? What do you think? So Fern says, stop, look both ways. Stop, look, okay. listen. Yep. I'm sorry, that was Randy. Those are good, Randy and Fern. Yeah. Randy and Fern. Uh -huh. Stuart, um, give way to trains. Edward says, don't get caught on the tracks. Right. <laughs> Watch out for a train from yeah. Sheila. Big funny eyeballs. Yeah, Luke these are all good. Terry. <laughs> <laughs> train doesn't give warning no. from Orlando. Mm -hmm. Right. These are all excellent, you guys. It's essentially saying be alert, you know, mm -hmm. that uh, a train trains might be coming through here very quickly, in fact, and they're not going to sound their horn. But if all you say is be alert for trains or something like that, uh, some of the things that you guys said, um, that tells me more directly what I need to do instead of just seeing this thing that's a sign that says no train horn. Good job. I think we made it a better sign than what is out there right now. Yay. <laughs> So that's the ACT connection. Remember, we're trying to resonate. We're trying to migrate our information into their contents, context and integrate using the best technology for the job. So Polina, I don't know, we have time. We've got eight minutes left. I gave you a couple of videos um, to show. Is there time to do that or should we just uh, do questions? Um, I think I can um share the videos afterwards when i will be sending the follow-up email with the um, recording of this webinar okay. what do you think it's up to you um i can go either way all right and if you guys have any questions for scott this is the high time to ask them and i also noticed one question from Timothy, but I'm not sure what it's about. He asks, does that mean we should avoid putting any possible material or feature that the users may need? Oh, um, I think I get the gist of your question. Uh, and and uh, it was Timothy that asked that? Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Timothy, uh, it it's uh, part of your... Um, it's part of your the design of your deliverable. So in other words, you want to prioritize your con content. So for instance, I just bopped ahead to my resources page in that um, when I give this talk, I often um, share um, a lot of resources. And so, but I don't want to um, be spending a lot of time of these in the in the flow of my talk about ACT. So I save these to the end and then I share them at the end. So things like um, the design kit from IDO.com is a great resource for you to go to that's just a wealth of information. And that field guide that you see there is, is actually free. Um, or this information from the D School is um, uh, at, at Stanford, uh, uh, Stanford University in California. Um, they have a lot of great free resources about user experience too. And so what you can do in your deliverable is make the primary things high priority on the screen, whether it's in the navigation or in the flow of their interactivity, but you can have areas of more information or links to more information that could be helpful for the end user that wants to dig deeper. I hope that answers your question. Mm -hmm. 
thank you very much Scott and while we are waiting for other questions to come in I would like to really quickly remind you guys that next week on Thursday we're going to have a second part of our workshop dedicated to iSpring Learn LMS where we'll be talking about advanced features of iSpring Learn LMS and actually showing you how you can use and use them and set them up so I will be sharing the invitation, the link to uh, that webinar rather soon. And I will also put the link to it in the chat box right now. And also there is a question from Sherry. Um, thank you very much, Scott. Do you have any webinars related mm -hmm. to design thinking? Um, I, I do speak about that within my with my talks, but um, I don't have one right now that is patterned around design thinking. I would really recommend uh, some of these things, uh, both the D School at Stanford and IDEO, um, and certainly Google too has some, uh, Google, uh, Google Ventures actually is what it is, and, and the home of the Google Sprint. Um, if you've ever done that, I've got that a couple slides here. Um, you can find information about design thinking there as well. Thank you very much. Okay, and there is also a question from Javier. In the creation of things for UX, where do you recommend to have that test A, B applied? Oh, A, B testing for um, just any kind of uh, technology. What was, what was the question again, Paulina? In the creation of things for UX, where do you recommend to have the okay. test applied? I would do that uh, as early on as possible in your process. So it might happen in, or it could happen in a prototyping phase. And prototyping doesn't have to be a real high end or what some people call a high fidelity um, format. It can be in a, it can be on pieces of paper actually. Um, it depends on what you're making, but it, once you get that in front of an audience and explain to them how it works, um, you can build a, an A prototype, so to speak, and a B prototype, so to speak. Um, and get user reactions to both of those in, in very early prototypes. But the other beautiful thing about these new technologies is in almost all cases, there is so much data behind the screens, so much analytics that we can learn about their usage. And we may not even have to do an A-B comparison because because the users will tell us what's most important to them by their actual usage of the deliverable. Thank you, and it looks like it does answer the question. Thank you very much, Scott. Good, good. <laughs> All right, so I think since we don't have any other questions at this point, it's time for us to wrap up the webinar. So I would like to thank you, Scott, okay. one more time thank for you making this happen. Thank you very much for this wonderful presentation and I hope that our attendees were able to get, like you said, some bits of valuable information from today's session. Yeah, please uh, visit uh, emergententerprise.com and let me know what you think about it. You're my end users <laughs> and so I'd like the feedback and uh, connect with me on LinkedIn. I'd like to stay connected. Awesome. And I would also like to, to thank all our today's audience because you guys have been very uh, responsive and communicated very well. I am super happy to see how you respond to Scott's questions. So thanks for keeping that conversation going. We really appreciate it. Thank you very much. Okay, so I guess I will see you guys at our next webinar next week on Thursday. And I shared the link to it in the chat box. I will also be sending the invitations tomorrow. And as per this webinar, I will be sending the recording of it as soon as it's ready, as soon as it's uploaded to the YouTube channel. And also I will be sharing the videos that Scott shared with me.
so you will be able to watch it at your own pace again okay so i hope all of you have a wonderful day thanks again scott and we'll see you next week all right thanks very much thanks and bye-bye everyone bye everybody